Okay. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for the privilege you've given us to come to your presence as we await your glorious return. You've commanded us to occupy until you come. Whether in growing in our relationships with you, or helping others, or showing others the way who have not believed in you yet. So Lord, as we are gathered here this morning, we pray that you speak to, your, to us through your word. To you be the glory and praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> My name is Edgar. Um, this morning, I'm bringing us God's word from Psalm 51, a psalm that many of us are familiar with and many of us per perhaps are in love with because it's one of my favorite psalms too. So before I read the psalm, um, at the top of the page, Psalm to Psalm 51, at the top of the page, you would find that the following words. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into the chamber. This introductory statement gives us a background to this psalm. I know many of us have read it or perhaps have listened to someone's been preached on it. But I so I am just going to give us an abridged summary of what the background is for the context of our message this morning. You will find the whole account in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and uh, 12. You can read that. But let me give us this abridged summary of what the story is so that it will set our text into context. It was one spring afternoon in ancient Israel when kings went to battle and King David sent all of his men to battle, but he himself remained at Jerusalem. During his idle time on the top of his roof, he laid eyes on the Sheba in her shower. David lusted over her and sent for her, and she came and laid with her and got her pregnant. To cover up his sin, he called for Uriah, uh, Uriah that's Bathsheba's husband, from the battlefield where he was. And it hoped that he would come and go to his house and sleep with his wife and cover up his sin. But unfortunately, Uriah, being this loyal soldier, refused to go home. So he slept in the king's court. And David was shocked. The following day, he invited him to a feast and got him drunk so that he would go home and be with his wife. But Uriah refused to go home. He slept still in the courtyard. In the morning, David realized that his plot has failed. He wrote a death warrant of, for Uriah and gave it to him to take to Joab, the commanding officer, on the battlefield. And Uriah did. He didn't know. And when he went with it, Uriah was killed in battle. Then Nathan the prophet approached David with this statement. You know, you can read the rest of the story and you will find it's very intriguing. He said to, to David, Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with a sword of the Ammonites. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's how we got here in Psalm 51. 
And now, so David writes this psalm in response to exactly what has happened um, in that story. So given this background of adultery, betrayal, and murder, it is no-brainer why this psalm is regarded um, as chief among the penitential psalms, and which have served as a model throughout history for many Christians on how to approach God in repentance. In fact, David addressed this psalm to the choir master, just like many of the psalms that he wrote, meaning that it was intended to be sung in the temple, because this was really important to David. David penned the psalm with only one thing on his mind, and that is, I have grievously sinned against the Lord. And I am desperately in need of one thing and only one thing, his forgiveness. Let us read Psalm 51. I have, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your word and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth. In the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me, within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. And it goes on from verse 13 downward unto the end. But we will just uh, deal with verse 1 to 12 this morning. And so the first point here, as we see from, is David's please plead with God. David came before God to make a desperate plea. Like I just mentioned that he had only one thing on his mind when he wrote the psalm. And that one thing is that he was desperately in need of God's forgiveness. So he left no stone unturned in his prayer. He refused to make it into a mere religious or pietistic kind of um, occasion signified by shallow or half-hearted repentance because he was called out, because he was cut. He had no intention to make it this way to a religious practice. Neither did he engage in an attempt to suit his conscience with excuses for his sin, or blame it on poor judgment. David didn't want to do anything with that. Because oftentimes we are all, most of sometimes we are prone to blame our faults on something else other than us. David, in his writing here, has, he had no intention to look in that direction. So David appealed to none of those at all, and he wanted, what well, he wanted was a deep cleansing from his sins. No wonder he used all three of the major terms that are used in Old Testament to describe an offense against God just in the opening verses here. We see this in verse 1b, 2a, and 2b 
where he used the words transgression, iniquity, and sin, and he repeated that interchangeably throughout the psalm, or most part of the psalm. Whereas in a, in a general sense, the word transgression, iniquity, and sin may refer to the same aberration or flouting of God's law or missing the mark of God's holy standard, each of these words cannot vary in degrees of the severity of sin. And please understand me here. I am not trivializing any sin. All sin is sin against God because they are violation of God's holy standards or missing the mark. However, the psalmist's usage of the word transgression emphasizes his outright rebellion or willful sin, which is sometimes referred to as presumptuous sin or daring the grace of God. It was very deliberate. And so he used the word transgression. In the epistle, Paul assures us that where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds the more. But Paul goes on to ask a question. Should we, should we therefore continue to sin? And he answers his own question with an emphatic, God forbid. God forbid that we should continue to sin. So David used the word iniquity to probably emphasize his premeditated choice to sleep with, with Uriah's wife and tried to cover it up by killing him and went on as though nothing happened. When this type of sin goes on for a while in our, even in our own lives, it may lead us to a loss of the fear of God. If we continue like that, sinning against God, it makes the fear of God becomes nothing to us. We no longer treat him as the holy God. We subject him to our own feelings and our own desires. But David here is approaching God with all seriousness, and so therefore he is calling out on God here to not only blot out his transgressions that he has, he has committed, but he is asking God here to cleanse him from or wash him from his iniquities because that was premeditated and he had killed a man. Of course, the usage of his, the word sin signifies the generic word for violation of God's word or missing the mark. And so transgression, iniquity, and sin are all sin. But David is looking at the gravity of the things that he has done. It was intentional. He refused to repent until he was called out. For example, in the state of Indiana, there are three categories of law. There is felony. There is uh, 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 felony, misdemeanor, and infractions. So, all these are crime in our books, but the severities are different. I am not equating this iniquity, transgression, and sin to that measure, but if you look into scriptures, you will realize that the way it has been used convey different severities against God. And here is David writing from the outset. He is looking at transgressions, he's looking at iniquity, he's looking at sin. God, this thing is serious. I have offended you. So David pleads for mercy in verse 1. And it's understandable why he will start this psalm with a humble plea. Have mercy on me, O God. Perhaps these words are some of the most salient words any sinner could use before the throne of God. When we are burdened in our heart with sin or that we are struggling with, we can come to God. Perhaps the first word that should ever come out of our mouths is a have mercy on me, O God. And David here shows us. And that's the first thing he, he approaches God with. He may not be, it, it, our sins may not be as grievous as David's, but he may be quietly destroying us 
from the inside. It may be destroying our relationship with God. It may be destroying your family. It may be destroying your character. And you go on as though it's nothing that's happened. And God is calling out unto us, come, come, lay it at my feet, and I will forgive you. The Lord Jesus commended a tax collector who, like David, came to God and would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. Be merciful to me. Unlike the Pharisee who stood there in his self-righteousness, proclaiming all the good that he has done. We observe here that David did not seem to, to, to balance his evil deeds with his good deeds, nor think that his service unto the Lord would atone for his offenses. David has one thing on his mind. God, you and I will deal with this. Have mercy upon me. I have sinned against you. So he pleaded with, for the mercies of God which you and I have readily available to us today because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4 verse 16 puts it, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's open to us. God has made it possible for us through Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through any other medium anymore. But we can come boldly onto his throne of grace. And he will help us in our time of need. It was with such confidence that David, although he was painfully aware of his grievous sin, relied on the mercies of God to fix him. And note here, the premise upon which David made his plea for mercy. He said, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. In verse 1, this seems like it was a direct appeal to God's covenantal declaration to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, 6 and 7. And hear what it says. The Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithful, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. David is aware of this. He approaches God. He's laying it at the feet of God, the one who is able to forgive him, the one who is able to cleanse him from his sin. Herein, David is showing us that the solution to sin problem is not according to anything else other than the steadfast love and mercy of God. The solution to our problem is the steadfast love of God, His mercies. And David is showing us here. In other words, we, he was assured that in spite of his unworthiness, he still belonged to God because the mercies and steadfast love of our Lord will bid him in. Friends, you and I have even a greater opportunity, a great assurance, a greater privilege today that we can boldly come to the throne of grace and Christ will forgive us. Oh, how much grace and mercy awaits us in the presence of the Lord when we do not depend on any merit of ours when we repent, but solely lean on the grace and mercies of the Lord through Jesus Christ to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And David pleads for forgiveness here. Now David was aware that there was more to plead for than just tend the tender mercies of God. He had grievously sinned against God and needed God to fix him. So he cried out to God, blot out my transgressions. In other words, wipe away my willful sin against you. Here David is acknowledging here that, the, that his sin was premeditated and is guilty as charged. No contest. 
As though that was not enough, he followed it with a graver indictment that he needed the Lord to wash away from him from. And this is his iniquity. He acknowledged that the stain was deep and needed a thorough washing. The stain, God, is too deep. I need your washing because that's the only thing that will purify me and make me whole again. And it was this kind of washing that he was pleading for, a ceremonial washing that he was familiar with. How blessed are we that a transaction that, that accords us a thorough washing from our iniquities has been accomplished in the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. How blessed are we? We are blessed, saints. The one who cleanses us from all the guilt and stain when we turn to him in repentance. Once more, David pleads for cleansing from his sin. In all, David asked God to blot out, wash him thoroughly, and cleanse him from transgression, from iniquity and sin. He's pleading with God here. Here are a few things we can learn from David's um, action here. David, one, David boldly approached God with his sin, trusting in nothing of his own merit, but in the steadfast love and abounding mercies of God. Are you struggling under the burden of sin that you are afraid to approach God today? That you are afraid to draw near unto God? Is that sin so grievous or is it just a minor sin? Friends, do not be afraid. Come to God. He can forgive and he can save. To you, Jesus is saying, come unto me, all you who are weak and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for mine is lighter. He is calling. Come. David shows us here. And David did not make light of his sin or rested in the notion of God's covenantal love for Israel. Rather, he realized that sin defiles us and renders us odious in the sight of a holy God. And also even makes us uneasy. And therefore, it requires forgiveness through a heartfelt repentance. Which leads us to the next thing David did. He confessed and repented. Verse 3 to 5. I mentioned earlier that David opened the psalm with some of the most striking words any sinner can approach God with. Have mercy on me, O God. Those words to not only relationally position oneself to the benevolence of God. But it also demonstrates our humility and contrition of heart. That's the demonstration, our contrition of heart. And perhaps the next and most important disposition in repentance, like the fight against any undesirable behavior or habit or addiction, is to first acknowledge that there is a problem. Acknowledge that there is a problem. Once you do, that's going to be the beginning, the genesis of dealing with that problem. Hiding it or denying it only exacerbates it, does not take it away. In fact, it is safe to say that sin thrives in secrecy. You hide it, it thrives. And one of those sins that thrives in secrecy easily is pornography. Own it up. Tell a brother or sister, mature somebody who can walk you through or who could you be accountable to. But the more you hide it, the more it thrives, the more it eats you on the inside, the more it makes you filthy, the more it destroys you. It's not to hide it, but to bring it before God. And David acknowledges sin in verse 3. David did not only ask God to blot out his transgression or wash away his iniquity, without acknowledging what the specific sins were. He knew 
Therefore, he painfully admits to God, I know my transgression, my transgression and my sin is ever before me. And this indicates that he was aware of the heinous things he had done. And if he must engage in a heartfelt confession or true repentance, there ought to be no pretenses. For never again would David go down to sleep without thinking about the defilement of his bed. For never again would David send out word to his commanding officers without a nagging guilt on his mind of the letter he wrote to give to Uriah that got him killed. Never again, perhaps, David would sit down to eat without thinking about Uriah, eating with him and drinking, only to get him drunk and get him killed or hide his sin. And David is asking God. The only thing he knew that would take away the sin, I'm not going nowhere. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah, the only thing that he knew that would take away his sin was the forgiveness of God through repentance. And he alluded to the same notion in Psalm 32, verse 4 and 5. It says in Psalm 32, 4 and 5, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. David knew how to approach God, and he's teaching us today that you and I can do the same. What implications can we draw from this? One, that there is no sin that goes away by pretending that it does not exist or pushing it under the carpet or by drowning our consciences with some other destructive behavior or habit or patterns. It does not go away. For example, if you miserably hurt your wife, the offense does not go away by washing dishes or doing one or several things on our long to-do list. Sometimes it just requires you sit down. I am sorry, forgive me. Forgive me and you can build your relationship. David acknowledged sinning against God. And he goes deeper to the heart of the matter here by acknowledging that he sinned against God. Against you and only you have I sinned. And we must be very careful here. David was not referring to the fact that he did not sin. Like he was just so cavalier about his attitude that he didn't sin against anybody. Because some have suggested that it may be his, his, his royal prerogative where he was thinking of himself as I am not accountable to anyone but God. That's not true. I don't believe it. But David was saying to God that you against you in comparison to what I have done against man. The sin, the high treason I've committed against you is worse than anything else that I could ever do. And so David here is saying, you emphasizing, making the strong emphasis against you. You only have I sinned. And David acknowledged the grievousness of his sin and the sight of God in verse 4. He also lamented the fact that he had done what was grievous in the sight of God. It was even unconscionable by his own estimation, let alone a holy God. He could not even bear it after Nathan laid it before him. You go read us story, you'll like it. David was angry. Where is that man? Show me. I will kill him. I will do this. I would. And Nathan looks at him after his fury. David, you are that man. He was angry because what Nathan told him. So David here says, and he says, What I have done in your sight is grievous, Lord. Have mercy upon me. It's a genuine repentance. 
does not mean emotional response. Does not mean, you know, Scripture says, for well, godly sorrow leads to repentance. Right? It has to be that which comes from our hearts. But what does that mean then? That true repentance is a gift from God. We cannot by ourselves really walk up to God and just really pour out our hearts in the way that he wants us to until the Holy Spirit empowers us and gives us grace. In fact, that's what David goes on to say in verse 5. He said, I was conceived in sin. My mother conceived me in sin. But mind you, David was not again blaming it on his upbringing. Or he was not saying that even my mother, I am a son of an adulterous life. That's not what David is saying. Or how most of us do today. Today, nobody takes responsibility for nothing. We all have to blame something for something. Our bad behaviors are blamed on our upbringing. If you do something, it's just poor judgment. Everybody blames something else than the actor themselves. David is not doing that here. But David is acknowledging his humanity, his weakness. And Paul says to us that, before that, it is a fact that our human spirit is broken beyond any ability to fix it. We are. We have the Adamic nature in us. We are prone to err, to sin. We have it in us. But the grace of Jesus Christ has appeared to give us grace. And to empower us, Paul says in Romans 5, 6, For while we were still sinners, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And it is he, Paul says in Philippians also, it is he who wills and acts in us to do according to his good pleasure. Not our humanness. Not our ability. You cannot deal with sin problem through some therapeutical methods or some self-help methods or something that you think that if you will power, it takes the grace of God to help us. David acknowledges the grace of God and he ends up in section and the praise that leaning into the very grace that we are talking about here to teach him truth and wisdom in inward being. Friends, whatever God requires of us, he himself works in us. If we allow him, he does in us. If we allow him, he will do that. What are you struggling with right now? Is it a great sin? God's mercy is greater still. What are you struggling with? Is it a little sin? Is it a pet sin? God's grace is greater still. Is it a prolonged sin or habit you're finding hard to break? God's, God is rich in mercy to fix you. Come. Don't hold it back. Come and repent. Lastly, we look at this briefly. David's cry for restoration. We'll go through this briefly here. After, he had, after his heartfelt confession and repentance, David now turned his attention to a plethora of excellent petitions for restoration. If you're here this morning and you feel estranged from the love of God, or you no longer can honestly state the joy of what it means to be a Christian, or maybe you feel unworthy to approach God, because of your past life or your present sin. Or you have never experienced the life-given grace that comes from the gospel of salvation. It is my hope and prayer that you find grace in David's petitions, even as you make it your own in Jesus' name. And you would observe here in verse 7 to 12 that David used about 12 action words. He was, it's very dense, rapidly. He's just going rapid at it. 
and asking God what he wants now, petitions of what he wants. First, he says, petition for purging and cleansing from his sin. He pleads, purge me. And purge is a very strong word. But he didn't stop there, he said, with hyssop. And that's, you know, hyssop, the bunch of hyssop, branches of hyssop was used um, by the priest for purification of sprinkling, purification water. But it's also, it's also used uh, to, to sprinkle the blood on the Passover. So whichever you say David is looking at here. But he says, do this. Purge me. Do not just make it light. Cleanse me thoroughly, and I will be clean. And Hebrews 12 alludes to the sprinkled blood of Christ, which speaks better words than the blood of Abel. And we know now that the blood of Jesus is indeed the hope of forgiveness and purification for all our sins. He tells us in 1 John, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness, if we draw near to him. And David petitioned also for pardoning from his sin and to restore unto him the gladness, of uh, uh, joy and gladness. He says, we observe that he did not only place the restoration of his joy and gladness before. Look at here. He did not start with saying, give me joy and gladness and cleanse me. Many people will go that way. But he said, cleanse me and give me joy and gladness. Purge me. Because we saw that his predecessor did the same thing in, in, in the case of Saul. And when the Spirit of God had left him, meaning the grace of God that called him to be king had left him, and Saul appealed to Samuel, that please go with me, so that you, I may appear well before the elders here. So I may look well before the people. Please forgive me and do not cleanse, just restore my past glory. Just make me look again the way I used to look. David says, no, purge me. I'm not care. I'm not mindful about any look in front of the people. And he calls out here again. He says, for verse 9, he says, as he also petitions here in verse 9. That he are asking for cleansing. And one wonder why David will repeat the same thing again from cleansing from his iniquity. But in verse 10, he gives us this clue. David is praying as one who has truly repented and has uh, left his sin behind. And now he wants to start anew. David goes on petitioning God, restore unto me the joy of salvation. And this is where I will end today. I will ask you this question. Do you still have that joy that comes with salvation? Are you still joyful? Do you see, are you excited about things of God still? Are you still enamored by the grace of Christ that saved you? Do you still sit down and think, what would have been my life if Christ did not die for me? Do you still think of those things? So David here is not saying God is taking his salvation away. He's talking about the joy that comes with salvation, that, that, that joy that comes when we are walking in the light as he is in the light. First John tells us that. He says, God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, if we say we are walking in the light but have darkness in us, we deceive ourselves. We are liars. But if, he, if we are walking in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. David is asking, give me that joy, that joy of serving you, that joy of rejoicing I am your child. That joy of gladness that I will tell other people who my Lord is. That joy, in fact, verse 13 says, and I will teach sinners 
transgressors. I will show them what it means that I have a God who can forgive. Oh, hallelujah. How I pray today that we will come to God, friends, that we will repent. Why do we forfeit this grace and blessings of the Lord only because we do not take everything to him in prayer? Let's learn from David. One final word here, and I will finally uh, close with this quotation by uh, Matt Elberg. It says, our view of sin should not be a failure of performance rather than a failure of intimacy. And true repentance comes not merely by understanding the relational aspect of sin, but by understanding the nature of of the one with whom we are in relationship. In other words, the more we see God as glorious and holy, the more we'll see sin as something to weep over. Repentance is less about feeling bad about our behavior. It's more about feeling the awe and the light of God. If we seek him, he might just surprise us individual revival or collective revival. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for entreating us today. Help us just go home, think about it, pray about it, and let us just flow with the spirit of God to purge, purify, and cleanse us. In your name we pray.